Today we begin a new study series looking at the Bible itself, where it came from, how people worked with God to write down and preserve God's word, and how we use it in our lives today. We start with a story from the book of Acts, where one of the 12 apostles, Philip, meets a man from Ethiopia who wants to know more about God. We read from chapter 8. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Candake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, Do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, How can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as the lamb is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So, beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. May the reading and hearing of God's word be blessed today. Amen. The Bible. Some of us love it. Some of us haven't looked at it for a while. Some of us are frankly a little intimidated by it. When I was in campus ministry working with college students, we did a little uh, experiment one time. And we went to a whole bunch of websites looking at what different churches believed, what they were telling the world was important to their church. And as we were going through these websites, we discovered that there were two distinct camps of church websites. There were the churches, when you get to their What We Believe page, they start with the Bible. And then there were the churches that start with God. And it was really interesting to kind of see what these churches were doing and what was important to them and how they were approaching life in the world today. We had a conversation about does this distinction matter? Because it became clear that it was really important to churches whether they put the Bible first or whether they put God first. And it made us really wonder what is the connection between God, us, and the Bible? Now, a bunch of us, I think, often take the Bible for granted. Some of us have at least one, if not a whole bunch, in different translations, just like we have up on the altar today, that maybe are gathering some dust here and there in our houses. When I was in my 30s, I came across a wonderful book called Wide as the Waters. It was one of those history books that looks at one little slice, one little story of history and goes really in depth. And what it was doing was looking at the history of the translation of the Bible into English, which had started in the 13 and 1400s, a little bit here and there, uh, with William Wycliffe and with Tyndale, and then, of course, eventually became the King James Bible, which came out in the very early 1600s. But along the way, There were times when having even one page of the Bible in English was literally a death sentence in England. If you had any section of the Bible in English, 
you were put to death. There was a group of people trying to keep control of the church, of God, of the way things were, and they wanted the Bible to remain in Latin. As I read that book, I felt really challenged. I wondered, am I willing to put my life on the line to have the Bible in a language that I can read and understand myself? Do I care that much about the Bible? So we're going to take some time to look at the Bible now. The picture here is from yesterday. My daughter and I went and did a 10K run down in Waukesha County at Neshota County Park. We had a great time. I got in 18,000 steps yesterday, and I am still standing up. This is my great achievement. And most importantly, I was not the last person. Uh, there was one person who finished after me. Um, and I also um, came in seventh for my age group. Of course, there were only seven in my age group. <laughs> but I bring this up not because I did such a fantastic job getting a t-shirt yesterday, but the race was really an interesting event. Now, I've signed up to do one of these once a month from April to October. It's called the Wisconsin Trail Assail Group. And this was the second one I did, and it's a really well-run race. They have lots of volunteers. They've got a great finish line. They've got great music. They've got a whole table of fresh fruit when you're done. It's fantastic. But what really touched me yesterday was how welcoming this race is. There's a 5K, there's a 10K, 10K is 6.2 miles, except we're on trails, so it ended up being six and a half miles. I know three-tenths of a mile doesn't sound like much, <laughs> but when you're going up and down some significant hills in the woods, it all adds up. And there's a half marathon. But they also have a 1K race for little kids. And there were kids who were doing the other races. I saw a mom holding hands with maybe an eight-year-old girl and they were doing the half marathon, which is 13.1 miles. So there were people of all ages. When I was going through the age groupings, because they gave medals, special finishing medals for first and second place in every age group, there were people in their 80s, as well as the three-year-olds doing the 1K. So it was all ages. And it is a race that is welcoming to walkers, like myself, who don't run very fast. But walkers were out welcome to every stage of the race. Now, this is one thing that a lot of races have very strict time limits. You have to be able to finish in a certain time, or you can't even sign up. Boston Marathon, of course, is the most famous of these. You have to actually run a different marathon and prove that you can run at a certain speed to even be able to apply for the Boston Marathon. Now, as I was getting close to finishing this race, it was a two-lap race yesterday, I was coming up to my last race coordinator, watcher, person, and my daughter had stopped to get some water at a water stop. So I was chatting a little bit with this person as my daughter was catching up, and she's like, wow, you're almost there. I said, yeah, I know, I'm so slow. <laughs> and she's like, you know, it doesn't matter. It's a beautiful day. It's not raining. And it's beautiful watching the leaves coming out on the trees, and you are here, and we are just all having a good time. And I just thought how gracious this person was, how welcoming Every person who was there felt good to be there and knew that they belonged. And so that just really touched me yesterday about this huge group of hundreds of people who were so diverse in so many ways, and everyone was happy and welcome. Now this next picture, I've had a long week. In addition to going on this walk, I took a bus trip to Dayton, Ohio, on Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's part of the Institute for Congregational Development here in our Wisconsin conference. And there were 30 people who went to see what Christ Church, 
which is one church of a group called the Gem City Church Collective. Gem City is a nickname for the city of Dayton, one of the many things I learned on this trip. But Christ Church is what they call an inherited church. It's over 100 years old. It's an aging congregation. They have over 100 members who are homebound right now. It's a pretty good-sized church, but not huge. Um, when they started this church collective, they had, you know, three, 400 people that were part of Christ Church. So a good-sized church, but not huge. It is United Methodist, as you can see there. But they had the idea that God intended for them to be multiplying God's grace in the world, to be bringing more and more people to know God, to love God, and to serve God. And so they started looking for ways that they could reach out, and they became this collective where there are now five churches. And let's see the next slide. This is Mosaic Church, uh, their front doors. This is a church plant that they started a few years ago. They now worship 545 people in four services every week. This church was a plant. It was meeting in a shopping mall. Uh, their utility bill got too high. They wanted to move to a new location. There was another church called St. Andrews who had hit their peak in 2004 and had been declining ever since. And by 2018, they were like, God, what is it that you have for us? We're going nowhere but down. We've got a decent building and a good location, but we are not bringing people in. We are aging out. People are not coming anymore. So St. Andrews, a few years ago, about the time of the pandemic, decided to be adopted by this collective, and Mosaic found a new physical home for their ministry. And overall, I don't even know how many people are coming to all the different churches they have going these days. They have dinner church. They have a Philippine-American church. Lots of different churches going on. But one of the things that really struck me with visiting these churches, and this next slide is a poster that I saw at Mosaic. It's a little hard to see. There's some glare. But it's a poster they made with pictures of the people at Mosaic Church, and it says, Better Together. And this is a huge theme of this collective. It doesn't matter that they come from all different walks of life, one of their fastest growing churches is a recovery church that's full of people who have experience with addictions. They come from all sorts of walks of life, but they know that they are better together. They don't agree on everything. They don't do everything the same, but they are better together. The problem is, and the primary reason that we are talking about making sense of the Bible now is if you do a Google search in this next slide, I put in United Methodist separation. And the first two articles I found was why you should be worried about the split in the Methodist church at Politico's website, which is a major polit politics website from Washington, D.C. Christianity Today, which is an evangelical magazine. United Methodists lose 1,800 churches in split over LGBTQ stance. That's from January. That's not all the churches that are leaving right now. But keep in mind, we have over 32,000 churches, United Methodist churches in the US. Um, so 1,800 isn't that many. Um, but we may look for these places where we are being together and how good it feels like at the race and at the Gem City Church Collective but it doesn't feel like that's what the United Methodist Church is about right now. In West Ohio, where I was just visiting, it looks like they're going to lose about 25 to 30 percent of their congregations this year. Uh, so about 250 churches are leaving there. We are leaving, losing about 10 to 15 percent of our churches here in the Wisconsin Conference. Which brings up this question, can we be together if we don't agree on everything? Now, the particular issue that we're arguing about right now is human sexuality, the role of LGBTQ people in the United Methodist Church. But the thing is, we already have been doing ministry together for decades, for generations, without agreeing on everything. Baptism is a perfect example. Some of us think you have to be fully dunked 
Some of us think just a little bit on the very top of your head is enough. Some of us think babies can be baptized. Some of us think that you need to be old enough to make a choice for yourself. These are decisions that have divided other churches. But as United Methodists, we're still one church. We have different ways of understanding baptism and doing baptism, but we are still better together. But the issue of human sexuality is one where some people think we cannot be together on this issue. Some groups want to be part of a church that has a greater percentage of agreement. They would like to aim for 90 or even 100% agreement. The new global Methodist church that is getting started, they have a catechism, a list of what they believe, and it's 76 or 77 items. The interesting thing is, if you want to become a member of the Global Methodist Church, you have to memorize all of them. Sound good to anyone? (laughs) I think I'll pass on that one. But this is why we are going to talk about the Bible now, because the reality is there are several ways of approaching the Bible, of reading the Bible. There are people who say we need to take every word literally and every word is equally important with every other word. There are some other people that are like, we just need to be inspired by Jesus and we don't need to worry about the details. And I suspect most of us fall somewhere in between those two camps. I don't think all of us take the same approach to reading the Bible And how can we be together? Now, I found a great picture (laughs) of a Bible that has not been read for a while. And it reminded me of a time in college. I had, I grew up in a Lutheran family, and in my family, you could go to any college in the United States as long as it was Lutheran. I went to Valparaiso University in Indiana, where I met a guy the first week of college, and we eventually got married. While we were at Valpo, we each had to take three theology classes in order to graduate. While I was in college, my parents moved from Watertown, Wisconsin to Austin, Texas. They found another Lutheran church to join, and in the summers, I now went to Texas. Little bit of culture shock for me, and heat shock. One summer when I was down there, they had a visiting pastor in for a month, and he had a special Bible study class going. And my mom was in, so she's like, come along. I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever, mom. I'm a college kid. But I went. And we're sitting there in the class, and we've got our Bibles open, and there's like 20 people in the class. And the guy's like, oh, you're new. I'm like, yeah, you know, gave my name. And he's like, well, you know, who are you? Like, what are you doing and stuff? I'm like, well, I'm a college student. I'm home for the summer. Where do you go to college? Oh, Valparaiso University. Oh. That's a good school. And then he looks at me, he says, well, you already know all of this, and you could lead this class, because I know Valpo has really good, you know, Bible education. And I froze. I'm sitting there going, what are you talking about? I'm like, I can't even remember all the books in the Bible. I If you named a book, there's no way I could just find it, much less tell you what was in the book. I was horrified. I'm like, I don't know anything. I felt like I was put on the spot. Now, maybe I knew more than some other people, but I knew there were a lot of people that knew more than me, like this guy. And I didn't feel good in that moment. I felt very inadequate But I hold on to that feeling because I think all of us have had a moment when we feel like there's someone that knows more about the Bible than us. And the truth is, you're right. (laughs) There will always be someone else that knows more about the Bible than any one of us. But that's okay, and that's not what matters. Nowhere in the Bible does God say, I'm going to judge you based on how well you know your Bible. (laughs) Nowhere. Each of us has our own connection to the Bible. Each of us has had our own experience. Each of us knows what we know. And where we are right now 
Jesus still loves us. Jesus' love is not based on our connection to the Bible. Now, some of us have a practice of reading at least a little bit of the Bible every day. Some of us read big chunks and regularly read through the entire thing. Some of us listen to audio versions, maybe when we're walking or driving to work. Podcasts are great. There's one great Bible I saw. It's a graphic novel, a cartoon, and it all, all the illustrations are Lego brick people. Whatever the Bible is that works for you to connect, go for it. Now, as I said, some of the confusion we have as individuals and as a church is there are different ways of approaching the Bible, of reading the Bible, and it's confusing, and sometimes we're coming from different places, and sometimes our conversations are tough. One of the things that I would like to offer to you, and there's a book out in the lobby that says Better Together on it, and there is this sheet. You cannot read it from where you're sitting because there's a huge list of Bible verses on this sheet. But I invite you to take this sheet home with you, and it's probably going to take you 20 or 30 minutes to read through this. This is not something to do quickly. But there are four categories on here. Because when we read the Bible, there are some verses we get to that are truly beautiful to us and we know are essential for our salvation. God is truly speaking through these verses and they mean a lot to us. We cherish these verses. We often memorize these verses. These are really important to us. So there's one category of Bible verses that's like, we absolutely need these Bible verses. This is what my faith is based on. And then there are a couple categories that are mostly or kind of important. Maybe it's a personal favorite, but it's maybe not someone else's personal favorite. But these are the everyday verses. We turn to them. We learn good things from them. They're important most of the time. And then there are some verses You laugh. I haven't even said anything yet. There are maybe some verses that we think their time has passed. They were maybe relevant for people in a different place, a different time, a different culture. Maybe they're not important anymore, and maybe we could just get rid of them. Understand the time and place they were important, maybe learn something from that, but maybe the verses themselves, their time has passed. Now, you're like, really, pastor? I lift up perhaps the verses about how slavery is okay. We've pretty much all decided slavery, different time, different place. The slavery verses should maybe go in there. I invite you to fill out this survey and then maybe sit down with some friends, give me a call, or maybe we're going to have some um, small groups starting after Memorial Day that will be discussing the book. Bring this along to some of those conversations. Compare them with each other. I think it would be really interesting to go through and see which ones we think are absolutely necessary, which ones... And this is just a short sampling of the Bible, obviously. But as we go through here, we start to learn something about each other. We start to realize that God speaks to each of us in different ways. And we have been together in ministry for a long time. We hope to be in ministry together for a long time to come. But my guess is there will be no two sheets that will have the same priority listings among the people of this congregation. So these questions and thoughts, you know, what is the Bible? How important is it to us? How do we read the Bible? These are the thoughts that bring us to our Bible reading today. And frankly, this is a Bible story that isn't necessarily well known to a lot of people. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch from the book of Acts. 
And there are two things I want us to look at today in this story. The first one is the Bible itself. The eunuch is reading the scroll of the book of Isaiah. Now, at this time, they don't have a book, a bound book like we do. There is a scroll of Isaiah. Isaiah is a very long prophet, so they get one, he gets one whole scroll. There are scrolls with the books of the law. Uh, so it's not like you're carrying the entire Bible like we know it around. But he's reading the Bible as he knows it, the scroll of Isaiah. And as we show up in this story, standing with Philip, meeting the Ethiopian in his chariot or his carriage as he's driving from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia, we see that the Ethiopian is reading. And what I want to see here is that just as the Ethiopian needed instruction, needed guidance, he's like, I can't understand this completely if someone doesn't explain it to me. We are the Ethiopian as well. All of us have a time when we need someone to be sitting with us as we read the Bible, helping us understand, helping us interpret it, giving us guidance. The Bible itself is telling us it is okay to not understand the Bible. It is okay to sit together and wrestle with the text and work through it together. We need to do this to come to understand who God is and how God is working in the world. As we think about this, I think it's really important for us to see and understand it's okay to interpret the Bible. It is okay to ask questions. Now, as we think about this, it is clear that the Bible itself is not God. We are not here to worship the Bible which is why we don't always have the Bible on the front altar, because we are not here to worship this. We are here to worship God. The Bible is a tool that points us towards God, but the Bible itself is not God. And I think that is one of the reasons why some churches put God first when they explain what they believe on their websites. They want to make sure we remember it is not about the physical book. It is simply a pointer that sends us in the direction to understand God. Now, one of the things to remember is the Bible is not an instruction manual. Now, my Ford came with a beautiful instruction manual in the glove compartment that is very handy at different times. But the Bible has moments of instruction, but it has moments of poetry. It has moments of grief and joy, it has moments of history, it has so much more to it. And those different types of stories and texts sometimes are complicated and confusing when we put them together. Now my race yesterday was a Mother's Day race and several people were running with t-shirts from previous Mother's Day, and one of them says, life doesn't come with a manual, it comes with a mom. <laughs> life with God comes with Jesus. Jesus is the complete manual that God gives us. It is through Jesus that we have the most complete understanding of who God is and who, how God is working in the world today. The Bible simply points us toward Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I myself have done this, and I've seen other people do it where we've got a problem in our life, so we grab one of these Bibles, and we close our eyes, and we start flipping pages, and we stick our finger down, because God is going to give us great insight and wisdom and those who escape the sword shall return from the land of Egypt to the land of Judah, few in number. Oh, that's maybe not such an inspiring passage right there. The Bible is not a magic eight ball that's going to give us something that we can base our life on. It's not fortune telling. 
is not going to lead us to prosperity. The Bible is a tool, and it's not always easy to use. It's not always straightforward. We need to embrace community so we can get instruction, so that we can study together. We can wrestle with this text, just as Jacob wrestled with God one night. And we have to remember that the Bible tells us so. The Bible tells us to look for instruction, to interpret it, to wrestle with it, to figure things out. Now, the second element that I want us to think about is that there is a person with Philip in this carriage. Now, in this icon, we see the beautiful headgear that the guy is wearing, the fancy clothes. This is a wealthy, important, powerful man. He's a treasurer from Ethiopia. He works in the royal court. He has power. He has stature. But he has a hunger for God. He has ridden in a chariot from Ethiopia all the way to Jerusalem. That's a long way. That's a really long way in an open chariot. But he wanted to know God. And after worshiping at the temple, worshiping in a place where he was limited, he did not get a complete welcome like at my race yesterday. When you go to the temple in Jerusalem, there's the court of the Gentiles, and he was welcome there. But then there's the court of the women, then there's the court where the Jewish men were welcome. He was set apart at the temple, but he still came so he could come to know God and love God. So he is continuing to study on his way home. Philip shows up. He says, Philip, will you teach me? Now, we don't know this guy's name. All we know is he's from Ethiopia. He's a government official and he's a eunuch. We don't talk about eunuchs much these days. But that status puts him in a minority group. He's in a sexual minority. He's in a group of people that most people are not like him. He is set apart. His personal life is not that of other men. He has one type of social standing, but most eunuchs didn't have a lot of friends because most people didn't really trust eunuchs. Eunuchs weren't like everyone else. They were different. People did not get close to them. This story shows us that the earliest apostles followed in the way of Jesus. They were always looking for the people who were on the margins, who were set aside, who were the outsiders. The people who were looking for a place to belong, who thought that this was a God who might love them in a way that no one else does. And Philip said yes, as the Ethiopian understood what Philip was teaching him. He saw water. He said, can I be baptized? And Philip said, yes. The Ethiopian went on to return to Ethiopia, and Ethiopia has had a Christian church ever since for 2,000 years. The Ethiopian brought the good news. He preached the good news in a new land. So from the earliest days when we read the book of Acts here, we have an apostle who welcomes a sexual minority and makes them an equal member in the new church. But we have to be real. The issue of human sexuality and gender is a hot button issue today in our country. We have many different understandings on this issue and in some cases, in some communities, we are passing laws related to this issue. Some of us would like to avoid it and not talk about it at all. Some of us have some very personal connections to this issue. The Bible has several verses that get quoted a lot when people talk about the issue of human sexuality and gender, but I seldom hear people bring up this story and talk about the inclusion of the Ethiopian eunuch. As we go through our look at the Bible, my goal is not to change anyone's mind, but I do hope that we become aware 
of how we ourselves approach the Bible, where we stand with our understanding on LGBTQ issues, and grow in our understanding of where other people are. There's another sheet that says general information on human sexuality, and the first section gives six different theological positions on human sexuality. My guess is we have at least five of those positions in our congregation, maybe we have all six. And we've been getting along so far. But I want us to understand where each person's coming from. I want us to get to a place where we can honor and respect each other, that we're all trying to be faithful and obedient to our understanding of God in the world today. As we go through this conversation, I hope we can share our stories and experiences with each other. I hope we can be kind to each other. There's also a brochure in the Bible with what, or in the lobby with some of the passages of what the Bible says on both sides of this issue. Now our denomination may be having a big fight about this, but the other reason that we're having this conversation now in this congregation is that when guests come and they ask to speak to me, hey pastor, can we ask you a question? Their first question has always been, where does this congregation stand on this issue? Because of that, the church council has put together what we're calling an inclusion team to facilitate this conversation. And they're the ones that helped plan this worship series. And they will be helping to lead our small groups as we meet this summer, where we can talk about this, talk about what's in the Bible, how we understand the Bible, talk about our experiences with the issue of human sexuality, and most importantly, come together where we can come up with a statement that reflects this congregation, who we are, who we welcome, how we do ministry together. Develop a statement that we can take a vote on this fall and we can put up and that we can all use when new people come and ask us this question. As we go forward together in the coming weeks, I want us to remember that the Bible doesn't have to be scary or intimidating, but it does ask us to get involved with it, to take some time, to do some work with it, in conversation with each other, and in openness to God speaking through it to us today. God is calling us to sit together just like Philip and the Ethiopian, to talk and to learn and perhaps to find that we are better together, no matter what our understandings and experiences are. Because the Bible tells us so. Amen. <laughs>